So now let's take a look at this. Designing rubrics and success criteria for evaluating student work and performance. As an example, let's think about a classroom where students have been challenged to write a descriptive essay about their favorite or least favorite food. As a teacher, I need to help ensure that my students are very clear about the steps that they go through in order to be successful in the writing task. But I also need to make clear what is the success criteria. In other words, how can I and they tell to what degree they're being successful on the writing task? As teachers, we often communicate to our students this part, helping students understand what it is that they should be doing. But if we're not careful, we can forget this part right here, helping students to understand clearly how they will be evaluated. That's why we work to design rubrics and success criteria to evaluate student work and performance. Now, one way that success criteria is often communicated to students is through a rubric, such as this. So you can see up here that there's a learning goal, and underneath it is communicated the success criteria. More specifically, we have criteria. In other words, the different knowledge or skill pieces based on the learning goal that we want our students to be able to demonstrate mastery of. For example, in this case, we want our students writing to convey word choice. The learning goal calls this sensory language, as you can see right up here. It's important that each of our criteria are aligned with our learning goal. We also need to write performance descriptions at different levels of performance. We might say that a student meets the criteria if he or she uses many of the five senses plus emotion to create the topic for the reader that they use words that are specific and creative language is used as well. We might also decide that students exceed the criteria if they do it at this level. The writer shows the reader the topic through descriptions that use all five senses plus emotion, vivid verbs and adjectives. Phrasing is original and natural. But we can also write descriptions of performance that do not meet the criteria. And then, as you can see at the top, we have different performance ratings, such as meets the criteria, exceeds the criteria, does not meet the criteria. We can even assign point values to each of the categories if we see fit to do so. And just to make sure that it's clear, all of this put together is a rubric. But whatever we determine and communicate to our students is the minimum level of acceptable performance, that is a success criteria. But whether we're talking about the entire rubric or just the success criteria, everything should be aligned to the learning goal. What we list in these categories here, the criteria that students are being evaluated on, is determined by what is in the learning goal itself. So if the learning goal has three parts, students utilizing vivid word choice and sensory language as one part, producing clear writing as another part, producing coherent writing as another part, if there are in fact three different parts to our learning goal, there should be three different criteria. But let's take a closer look at this learning goal. Maybe we decide that there are only two parts. Students will utilize vivid word choice and sensory language. That's one part. And that the other part is to produce clear and coherent writing, that this is all one. We would only need two criteria, one for vivid word choice and sensory language, as here, and maybe clear and coherent writing in this part right here. We also need to be careful that we don't just add in different categories based on other things we think are important. For example, let's say down here it says conventions, in other words, capitalization, spelling, punctuation. While this is important to writing, it might not necessarily have anything to do with the learning goal. So we have to be careful that the criteria that we list is tied to the learning goal and not just something that we also feel is important to the assignment. We should seek to articulate different levels of performance for each of our criteria and always make sure that the language is objective rather than subjective. And by far one of the most important things to keep in mind is the language used by the age group that we're working with. If we're working with third graders, the language of our rubric should be written in a way that can communicate clear feedback to that particular age group. So when we look at the wording of this rubric, it might be just fine for ninth grade and above. But if my age group is younger, I need to modify and adapt the language in a way that still articulates clearly each criteria at different levels of performance, but a way that can be easily understood by the student. Now, whatever success criteria will be used to evaluate student work, this should be clearly communicated to students before, 
during and after their work on a task. This helps guide students' efforts and allows them to periodically pause and self-assess their work. But if we don't communicate clear success criteria to our students before, during, and after a task, it's very possible that they'll put a lot of work in and feel disappointed or frustrated when their work does not meet the criteria that we have established. So how do we help ensure that we come up with clear and effective success criteria? Here are some guidelines that can be used when we select observable criteria for products, performances, and other assessments. Step one is to select the performance or product assessed and then either perform it yourself or imagine yourself performing it. This helps us as a teacher to understand the actual student actions that will need to be completed. So for an example, let's look at a performance or product that happens outside of school. Let's say that it's early in the summer and I've asked one of my sons to cut the grass. It's important that I physically perform the task myself, that I go out and cut the grass in order to start identifying what are each of the steps or actions that need to be completed. Now, as I cut the grass myself, I will more easily be able to list the important aspects of what it is that I want my sons to do when they cut the grass. And there could be numerous components to cutting the grass in a way that is acceptable. But I need to make sure that I'm focusing on the most important parts of the process or product. For example, I could focus on how the grass needs to be cut evenly. I could also take note that weed eating needs to be done to ensure that the edges of the lawn are even with the grass. And it's also important that everything gets cleaned up, that piles of grass are raked up, that the sidewalk is swept, and that all the grass clippings get bagged up and put into the truck to be taken to the dump. But if I'm not careful, I can get very carried away with what are all the important aspects of cutting the grass. That's why it's important to try to limit the number of performance criteria that can reasonably be observed and assessed. So even though all of these are important, making sure that the grass is cut evenly, making sure that the weed eating is done in a way that matches up with the lawn, that all piles are raked up, everything is swept, blown off, and hauled to the dump. In an effort to not overwhelm my sons, I might just focus on these three criteria, cutting the grass, weed eating, and cleanup. Now, in a classroom teaching scenario, it's always important to work with other educators. So when it comes to assessment, if possible, we should have a group of teachers work with us to think through the criteria. This actually helps to save time and ends up producing a more complete set of criteria that would be produced by any single teacher. So if we go back to our example of the lawn bean mode, I've already established in my mind what criteria are for successfully mowing the lawn. But I might also visit with my wife who has an eye for detail and my brother-in-law who does landscaping. Working together, we can produce a more complete set of criteria. That includes making sure that no damage is done to any structures such as fences or posts, or that we don't run over and damage any sprinkler heads in the yard. As we work and visit with others, we save time and end up with a more complete set of criteria than we would have been able to come up with by ourselves. Now the next step is to express the criteria both on a rubric and to students in terms of observable behavior or product characteristics. In other words, we need to be very specific when stating the criteria. We want to make sure that we have clear categories as well as descriptions of performance instead of being nonspecific and just saying great job or terrible job. That leads us to our sixth guideline, which is to avoid vague and ambiguous words. Think of words such as appropriately or good that can result in multiple interpretations between teacher and student. Vague language such as good or great can mean one thing to one person and something different to another person. Next, we need to make sure that we arrange performance criteria in the order in which they are likely to be observed. One reason for this is because it will save time when we observe and allows us to maintain focus on the performance. So let's go back to our example of mowing the lawn. Let's think about all of the things that I want my sons to do well when they cut the grass and put them in the order in which they're likely to be observed. It's very likely that first they'll be cutting the grass, followed by doing the edges and weed eating, and at the end doing all of the cleanup. Now one tip is this, to check for pre-existing performance criteria. In other words, instead of always starting from scratch, 
we can look for existing criteria or rubrics that we can modify in order to fit our learning goals, the assessment, and our students. Chances are that somewhere out there, another teacher or many teachers have put together success criteria for an assessment or learning task similar to the one that you and your students are working on. We can find a handful of these and select the components that are most related to what we are doing with our students. You could revise those and turn them into a success criteria that could be used to evaluate student performance and communicate to our students what successful completion of a task looks like. But also be careful about going out there and just using somebody else's success criteria or rubric. Chances are what somebody else has developed isn't exactly what you need for your learning goals, your assessment, and for your students. So altogether, here are guidelines that we can use when selecting observable criteria for products, performances, and other types of assessment. So let's take a glance at some sample rubrics in different content areas. Here we have a rubric for argumentative writing. We have clear categories based on the learning goal. We have descriptions of performance at each level, as well as different performance ratings. Here we see success criteria in the form of a rubric for science. The categories include planning the design, conducting investigation, representing, analyzing, and interpreting data, as well as using mathematics and computational thinking. We have descriptions of different levels of performance, as well as different performance ratings listed at the top. We can do the same thing in math. For example, here is a learning goal where students are asked to engage in effective problem solving and mathematical reasoning. Problem solving is listed as a category, and mathematical reasoning is represented in this category, reasoning and proof. In this particular example, descriptions of different levels of performance are listed vertically, but again we see different levels of performance listed. The same can be done in history or any other content area. Regardless of the content or the format we choose, success criteria communicated through a rubric should have all three of these elements. Clearly established criteria based on the learning goal, performance descriptions or descriptions of the skill or knowledge piece at different levels of performance, as well as a performance rating. But remember, whatever success criteria will be used to evaluate student work should be clearly communicated to our students before, during, and after their work on a task. We need to provide every opportunity for them to guide their efforts and allow them to periodically pause and self-assess their work. Now, sometimes when we come up with success criteria and put it in a rubric, it might be a little bit overwhelming to our students to see all of this information. So we should find a way to communicate the success criteria in a way that's clearer and more concise. We might, for example, just list each of the criteria and a brief description of what success looks like. In other words, instead of this entire rubric, we could use something more like this. Here you see just the criteria and we have included a brief description of what success looks like in each of the categories. Other formats of rubrics can also be used. Here is a single point rubric where we have just the criteria and the expected level of performance. And then on one side, we note to students what are areas that need work. And on the other side, we note how the work might exceed expectations. Other teachers might opt for something more like this, where the criteria or standard is written on the side with different levels of performance. And also included is a category for feedback that can be communicated to the student. But regardless of the amount of detail or the format that we choose to use to communicate success criteria to students, the goal should always be to communicate to students both what steps need to be followed in order to be successful on a learning task or assessment, as well as the success criteria for evaluating their performance, to ensure that they always know what to do and how they'll be evaluated.